Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In H.G. Wells' classic novel of 1895, The Time Machine, an adventurous Londoner heads off into a dark future where he clashes with cave-dwelling monsters, explores ruined cities, and witnesses the final moments of life on Earth. In the 1968 movie Planet of the Apes, Charlton Heston's character Taylor, an American astronaut, arrives on a nightmarish world run by a race of talking apes. Only at the film's climax, as he stumbles upon the remains of the Statue of Liberty, does Taylor realize with horror that he has not set foot on some far-off planet after all. Rather, he is home, 2,000 years in the future, and after a worldwide holocaust that has destroyed human civilization. Then there's Michael J. Fox's character, Marty McFly, who, in the 1985 Hollywood comedy blockbuster Back to the Future, travels through time to 1955. On doing so, he almost makes out with his then-teenage mom, comes perilously close to wiping out his own existence as a result of his time-traveling antics, and, in single-handed fashion, invents rock and roll. And let's not forget Bruce Willis in 1995's Twelve Monkeys. At least as far as megabucks movies and literary classics are concerned, the theme of time travel is a spectacularly successful one. But what of the real world? Are time travelers really among us? Is there a direct connection between the world of time travel and that of UFOs? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Just about everyone has heard of unidentified flying objects, or UFOs. But what about unidentified future objects? Alien encounters have been reported for decades. If there's one thing that the aliens are keen to tell us and have us believe is that they originate from other worlds. But are they being truthful with us? Might they really be time travelers? Why is it that our aliens conveniently speak our languages? How is that, with no trouble at all, they can breathe our atmosphere? Why do they abduct us and use us in bizarre genetic experiments? Surely we are not physically and genetically compatible with creatures from faraway solar systems. They assure us that we are indeed compatible, though. It all sounds far too convenient and carefully stage-managed. Maybe that's because they are not from faraway worlds after all. Perhaps they are from right here, on Earth. Not our Earth, so to speak, but the Earth of the future, the distant future, an Earth that is in ruins and at a time when the human race is perilously close to extinction. 
they travel into their distant past, our present, and engage in clandestine programs to reap DNA, cells, sperm, and eggs as a means to try and save what is left of us thousands of years from now. Keenly aware of the fact that the people of the 20th and 21st century held deep beliefs with regard to the concept of extraterrestrial life, they chose to adopt the guises of the alien things we believe in as a means to camouflage their real identities. Could that be the shocking truth? Formerly of the U.S. Air Force and one of the key military players in the famous UFO encounter at Rendlesham Forest, Suffolk, England, in December 1980, Sergeant Jim Penniston, in 1994, underwent hypnotic regression as part of an attempt to try and recall deeply buried data relative to what occurred to him during one of Britain's closest encounters. Very interestingly, and while under hypnosis, Penniston stated that our presumed aliens are, in reality, visitors from a far-flung future. That future, Penniston added, is very dark, in infinitely deep trouble, polluted, and where the human race is overwhelmingly blighted by reproductive problems. The answer to those same massive problems, Penniston was told by the entities he met in the woods, is that they travel into the distant past, to our present day, to secure sperm, eggs, and chromosomes, all as part of an effort to try and ensure the continuation of the severely waning human race of tomorrow. Time travel is not theoretically possible, or if it was, they'd really be here telling us about it, British physicist Professor Stephen Hawking famously said. And even if time travel did one day become a possibility, it would be beset by major problems, claimed Hawking. Suppose it were possible to go off in a rocket ship and come back before you set off. What would stop you from blowing up the rocket on its launch pad or otherwise preventing you from setting out in the first place? Not everyone agrees with Hawking. One possible way of traveling through time is via what are known in physics as wormholes, a term coined in 1957 by theoretical physicist John Wheeler. The wormhole is basically a shortcut through both space and time, and although firm evidence for the existence of these so-called time tunnels has not yet been firmly proven, they do not fall outside of the boundaries presented in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Then there is the matter of the sinister men in black. They are perceived by UFO researchers as human-looking alien creatures or government agents whose secret role is to silence UFO witnesses, something that history has shown they are very good at. Maybe, though, the MIB are not the bad guys after all. Perhaps they are time cops, working to ensure that UFO witnesses don't get too close to the truth, namely the time travel angle. After all, just about everything about the MIB is out of time. They almost always wear 1950s era's black suits. Their mode of transport, old-time Cadillac cars, is out of time as well. They have even asked witnesses on more than a few occasions, what time is it? Maybe they're actually asking what year they are in, or even which century. Perhaps in the distant future little is known of our time. Maybe we destroyed ourselves, and as a consequence, the people of the future are tasked with repairing the planet and doing their utmost to save what is left of our species. Possibly they've limited knowledge of our culture and even our fashions, apart from what they know from pages of aging, crumbling old magazines from the 1950s so they adopt the attire they assume will allow them to blend in with the people of the 21st century, when in reality it's the exact opposite. The MIB stand out like a sore thumb, or like a man out of time. Paranormal researcher Joshua P. Warren comments on this link between time travel and the men in black. It could be that the men in black follow all this UFO stuff around, that's their job, not that they're causing these things to happen, but they are alerted to it when there's a dangerous timeline issue that needs to be corrected. They're not necessarily the bad guys at all. They might be doing damage control, and maybe that includes warning and silencing witnesses to protect the time travel secret. They might be weird, and they might look weird, 
but their overall mission may be just to keep order and protect the timelines. Of course, we need to remain grounded on all of this. So far, there is no definitive proof whatsoever that we have or have ever had time travelers in our midst, and there's no evidence that UFOs are really time machines. So, in other words, everything is very much theoretical and speculative, and just about nothing else. But it doesn't hurt to speculate. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 for political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. I like to think I'm a pretty open-minded guy. I believe in God and spirits. I'm certain of extraterrestrial life. And I'm unwilling to dismiss outright anything anyone believes with absolute conviction. I believe they believe and reality is perception, so yeah. Now having turned 33 this year, I've lived a little while and I've seen things that would fall in the paranormal category. On today's Sunday morning, they were talking to Chip Coffey and he said something to the effect of paranormal means you don't know or you can't explain what happened, but you know something happened. I've had a number of those. Being the season for ghost stories, I'll share my experiences here. I know I've got a pretty damned powerful memory. I can remember pretty far back and I can remember instances with intense clarity, even mundane things. My earliest memory, of which there are two right around the same time and within the same house, I know I'm laying in a crib. I can see the bars. The direction I'm facing, laying on my stomach, I can see a window. It's either late or early, the light is dim and silvery outside. This bush has a pretty wicked shape to it. But as I'm looking at it, two glowing red eyes seem to open, and it takes the shape of a monster maybe like a pterodactyl, and I slowly turn my head the other way to not see the monster outside my window. Looking back on that memory, and the second one where I'm being held by my mother and we're watching fireworks outside, I realize it was just a bush and a car across the street, perhaps in their driveway, stepped on the brakes, lighting up the demon's eyes. That's hindsight. It doesn't change the fact that one of my earliest memories is of being scared of a monster staring me down. Growing up, I remember a lot of things, but being scared of ghosts and monsters came when I moved into the house that I mostly grew up in. My dad still lives in that house, though whatever plagued me doesn't seem to bother him. 
but of course, I was a kid. The first few nights we stayed there, sleeping on the couch before I had bedroom furniture, I nightmared of a man or thing staring at me through the two windows on the top of the front door. It wanted in. It wanted to get me. It was battering the door, and I was scared stiff. Like any kid, once I finally shook off the dream, I ran to my parents' room. The nightmares in that house were always intense like that, usually of something outside desperately trying to get me. I had many night terrors, inability to move despite feeling wide awake. Sometimes it would even feel like someone was sitting or lying in the bed with me. Once, I even felt the bed depress under someone's weight, with no one there. But those aren't ghosts. The ghosts, or phantoms as I like to label them, came once I was established in my room. They came into my room regularly out of my peripheral vision. I saw them daily, always outside of directly looking at them. Shadow people, male in shape, very tall, always coming in through my bedroom door. One of them was so vivid that I didn't realize I was seeing a phantom and believed my dad had stepped into the room, so I began to talk to him. My dad, 10 feet away in his own bedroom, finally did come walking in asking what I was talking about. I told him I was talking to him. I thought he had just stepped in. Needless to say, it was spooky for both of us. Standing in the kitchen one night, just talking to each other, I don't remember the conversation itself, just that we were talking. A toy car of mine jumped up off the carving table. Problem? No batteries. And this wasn't a it was sitting near the edge and fell to the floor thing. It drove six inches and launched itself three feet across the room right in front of me and my dad saw it just take off from a standstill. Again, we're both a little freaked, but laugh it off. In that house, besides phantoms, there was the thing in the kitchen. I never saw it, but I heard it. The first time was when I had two friends over for a slumber party on my seventh or eighth birthday. I thought my mom or dad had gotten up and was making coffee or breakfast at first, but the cabinets kept opening and shutting over and over. I laid there petrified as I realized there was no other sound, like a feat or bodily movement, just the cabinets swinging open and shutting with a clunk. I know I was awake because I looked at my friends, each sleeping on the floor, dead asleep. That wasn't the only time I heard it either. There were plenty of mornings the cabinets opened and shut, and I finally asked my dad if he was doing it or heard it to find that, no, he had no idea. Recently, staying the night there, I was actually scared I would hear that, but fortunately it seems the restless cabinet monster had finally found what it was looking for. My first full frontal encounter with a ghost came around Thanksgiving, in a little house in Sweetwater, Texas the family had gathered at. My dad and I slept on a hideaway bed in the living room. One night, I woke up I don't know when in the evening, but it was dark inside and out, just ambient light from outside, street lights or the moon, and much to my surprise, someone was sitting next to me, about my midsection between the edge of the bed and the TV, enough room for one person's width. Waking up and seeing this person staring at me was jarring enough, but I thought I recognized the face at first. I looked directly at her person I thought was my aunt. But as I looked directly in this thing's face, staring at me barely two feet from my face, I realized it had no eyes, just black, smoky pits. Slamming my eyes shut, terrified, I tried to will myself back to sleep. This was just a nightmare. I tried to make small movements to back myself up against my dad, Maybe I could annoy him awake to chase whatever it was away. I laid there with my eyes squeezed shut for a long while, relaxation only coming after nothing happened for so long. But I was still afraid to open my eyes, even when the morning light came. I asked my aunt about it. 
Had she come into the room to maybe check on me? Did she sleepwalk? Please, just tell me it was her and I was just confused in the darkness. But no. And then everyone started sharing crazy, scary encounters of their own, hardly making me feel safe, but at least not alone in my experience. Other than a general apprehension in the dark, the no-eyed ghost was the worst thing I saw for a long time. And I'm willing to concede that most of what I've explained here could all very well be explained away. But that's not all of my experiences. One in particular is more recent and happened over a period of months during all matter of hours, and I have corroborating witnesses. Near 21st and Garnett here in Tulsa are the Dove Park townhomes. I'd been living in a single bedroom for the last six months and the drummer in my band was looking to move out of the house that she was in and wanted to know if I'd be cool with rooming with her. We both worked for the same place. We were in a band together. It'd work out great. We could carpool, help each other with bills. Awesome. It was completely platonic, and she actually stayed there rarely, opting to stay the night with her boyfriend most of the time. So basically, I had a whole big place to myself, and she used one of the rooms as storage. She paid her half of everything on time, and we were good. But it wasn't good. Not all the time. The very first night in that place, and I was alone that night too. She hadn't moved her bed over yet. I heard strange sounds from across the street in a little strip shopping center, and then helicopters and sirens, and it was a commotion for a long while, making it difficult to sleep. Someone had been murdered at a nightclub shot dead in their car not two blocks from our apartments. It was a great start to our lease. Outward appearances made it seem like it was a decent neighborhood. Yeah, there was the aforementioned strip mall, but all around it was a decent neighborhood, so I was shocked and apprehensive about living in a place like that. Through that first week, we started having plumbing problems. I had a private little water closet just off the main bath which was between our two bedrooms upstairs. It always stank like sewage, and one time the toilet acted like it was backed up and my own efforts with a plunger weren't releasing whatever the stinking blockage was. I called the complex managers and they'd send a plumber. I went to work. That evening there was a work order receipt. They had fixed the problem. I went upstairs still a slight odor, but the toilet seemed to be working. The next morning, going through my routine, the exact same thing. Raw sewage smell, toilet backs up. My efforts fail. But when I went downstairs, the ceiling was leaking, dripping water all over my roommate's couch. Furious, I called both the apartment people and my roommate, and I just wanted out. Shootings, bad plumbing, ruining furniture, this was an exercise in frustration. But my roommate convinced me just to be patient. We couldn't really afford anywhere else or to back out anyway. I mostly quit using that toilet anymore, just to be on the safe side. These events just sort of set the table. In watching a million ghost shows and haunting specials and perusing YouTube surveillance footage of ghosts caught on film, a few things always stick out to me especially regarding the really inexplicable hauntings. Cold spots, sounds from above like footsteps or balls rolling, and a prevalent stinking smell. I had the stinking smell in my bathroom, which at first I attributed to poor plumbing, considering they couldn't fix the problem. But on many days and nights, being alone in the house, watching TV or playing a game, either in the living room or on my PC, which was set up in the kitchen, I could hear what sounded like a game of billiards going on upstairs, sounding like it was coming directly from my roommate's room. I went up often to check on things thinking something had fallen down, but nothing was ever out of place. On occasion, I would hear our neighbors or their kids through the walls, so I figured the kids were roughhousing upstairs and I was hearing reverberation downstairs. I began to dismiss it it was a symptom of living next to a family with kids. One evening, getting home after dark from work, I stepped into the house, set down my bag, and was about to go into the kitchen when a knock came at the door. 
I opened it up and it was our neighbors, husband and wife, looking concerned. They asked if everything was all right. Uh, yeah, I just got home. The looks on their faces put me off guard. They were startled. It sounded like there was a fight, a pretty bad one. We just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Again, I told them I had just got home and my roommate wasn't in. They were genuinely concerned. In this day and age of turning a blind eye, they came over together, ready to confront a domestic dispute, and I was all alone in a house that had been empty just moments before when they heard something. All three of us looked up the dark staircase just behind the front door. It was surreal, like out of a movie. I leaned back and looked at my back kitchen door to make sure that it hadn't been kicked in. Maybe there were burglars upstairs. I looked back at them, thanked them for letting me know, and I would check on it. The man said if there was a problem to let him know. I shut the door and scoured the first floor. Nothing was out of place, and I had unlocked the front door when I had come in. I finally worked up the courage to go upstairs, terrified of finding a living person ready to jump me, remotely scared of something paranormal thanks to strange noises and smells in the house. I turned on every light like a kid scared of the dark, reaching in quietly to flip the switch before I bodily entered the room. But no one was there. Nothing was out of place. I searched closets, under the beds, not a thing out of order. Whatever was happening in the house was happening even when we were away and our neighbors could hear it too. In the midst of all of this, my roommate and her boyfriend had their own experiences well, mostly with the sounds, telling me about hearing footsteps where no one was. This relieved me greatly. I'm not crazy. Other people can hear the sounds. The neighbors aren't the ones making them. They're hearing them too. But for about four or five months, that was it. Scary sounds. My best friend bought a house and asked if I'd want to move in. It'd be like a bachelor pad, three of us in a house together doing guy stuff 24-7. I still had a month on the lease, so I didn't feel like I could take him up on the offer. So he offered that I just pay my portion of the utilities and he'd give me the rent off for the first month because he'd still be making out better if I was only helping with the utilities. Sounded too good to pass up. I shut everything off except electricity and started to move out. My roommate was cool with it. She'd move out early too and in with her boyfriend. I slowly moved junk over in my car my computer being one of the last things I moved. I checked email and bills before preparing to power it down and take everything apart. Upstairs, I could hear footsteps and heavy movement, like furniture moving. This was different than the odd little billiards sound. It definitely sounded like a body and things moving. I assumed it was my roommate's boyfriend. He had been in and out helping her move so I paid it no mind and didn't think that it was our ghost by any means. Satisfied enough to turn off my computer and the monitor blinked out. How it was set up, you could see the living room reflected in the monitor's glass. A lamp was on in there and standing behind me between the back of my chair and the lamp, creating a darkened silhouette, was a man. I thought it was Josh come down to say hi or maybe to try and spook me. So I said, Hi, Josh, before turning around. Only when I turned around, there was nothing. No one, nobody, and no body. The house was empty and now very quiet. I ran upstairs, no lights on, and nothing else gone from the last time I'd been upstairs. It had finally shown itself, and it was right behind me. Just writing this, recalling it, sets my skin to crawling. I immediately called my friend and asked him to come over right then because I still had things to move to my car. After relating the tale, he refused. He didn't want to see a ghost. The coward. I kid, I was terrified and desperately wanted out myself. I wasn't exactly courageous in facing the unknown. He told me just to go ahead and stay the night at his house, starting that evening, to just get my stuff in broad daylight. I did and once that last month of our lease was up, I did a walkthrough with the manager. The smell still lingered in the upstairs bathroom, 
but nothing made a sound or showed up while we were there. Once we stepped back outside, I told him everything that had happened, in case he or the company needed to be made aware of that kind of thing. He didn't shrug me off. Instead, he told me of his own hauntings at a lake house he stayed in as a kid. A lot of people experience crazy things, and we worry we are crazy experiencing them, but we're not alone. I'm not embarrassed of my ghost stories. I'll share them with people gladly, and most people I've shared them with have had stories of their own. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Chances are you're familiar with the 1980 ghost movie classic The Changeling, even if you've never seen it. That's because the film's iconic scene of a red rubber ball bouncing down the stairs has been referenced in numerous horror flicks throughout the years. In fact, the sequence came in at number 54 on Bravo's list of 100 scariest movie moments, and Martin Scorsese listed The Changeling as one of the 11 scariest films of all time. More recently, Guillermo del Toro made numerous nods to the ghost flick in his horror gothic romance Crimson Peak. What you may not know about The Changeling, however, is that it's a tale of a malevolent spirit haunting a gloomy mansion, and it's based on a true story. In 1968, composer Russell Hunter moved from New York into the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion near Cheeseman Park in Denver, Colorado. He would later claim in an interview that he rented the estate for the unbelievable price of $200 per month because no one else wanted to live there. In February of 1969, Hunter began experiencing strange phenomena in the house. It started with an unbelievable banging and crashing every morning at 6 a.m that stopped whenever Hunter would get out of bed. Doors opened and closed by themselves, faucets turned off and on, and walls vibrated so violently that they knocked paintings to the floor. As he investigated these strange disturbances, Hunter claimed to have found a hidden staircase in the back of an upstairs closet. The narrow passageway led to a secret room where Hunter found the belongings, including a journal, of a young boy who had lived in the house a century ago. Hunter poured through the journal contents and conducted a seance to piece together the paranormal puzzle. He discerned the resident ghost was a sickly child who once lived in the home and had been heir to a fortune from his grandmother before succumbing to his infirmity. The boy's parents were worried his inheritance might pass to another family member if word got out about his death. So, the unscrupulous couple buried their dead son in an unmarked grave in a field southeast of Denver. They then adopted a boy from a local orphanage to pose as their child, who accepted the inheritance and later went on to great wealth and success. According to Hunter, the ghost of the sickly boy directed him to the aforementioned unmarked grave, which was now located beneath a house on South Dahlia Street in Denver the spirit reportedly threatened to harm the family living in the South Dahlia home if they didn't give Hunter permission to dig there. The family acquiesced. 
it wasn't long before Hunter and his team unearthed human remains, along with a gold medallion inscribed with the dead child's name. Yet the grisly discovery didn't solve Hunter's problem. In fact, the haunting only grew worse. A set of glass doors exploded in Hunter's face, severing an artery in his wrist. The wall behind Hunter's bed imploded and crumbled down on top of him. Fearing for his life, Hunter fled to a new house on Kearney Street, but the hauntings moved with him. Finally, Hunter called in a priest from the Epiphany Episcopal Church to perform an exorcism, which seemed to clear the air. Hunter's account will sound familiar to anyone who has seen the Changeling film. The red rubber ball even makes an appearance in the original tale, as it was apparently the sickly boy's favorite toy. Hunter's claims also seem like they would be easy enough to corroborate. And yes, when you begin inspecting Hunter's account, gaps do emerge. The Denver Library recently did an excellent job of fact-checking Hunter's ghostly claims. Among the library's findings is the absence of any concrete records that Hunter actually lived in the Henry Treat Williams mansion, though he did reside in Denver at the end of the 1960s where he helped his parents manage the Three Birches Lodge in Boulder. As for the boy who supposedly haunted the house, there isn't any solid record of him either, and there's no way he lived in the house a century before Hunter did as it wasn't even built until 1892. There are enough odd mysteries surrounding Hunter's account to make a paranormal investigator curious, though, including the fact that the family who built the mansion owned farmland around where the child's unmarked grave was said to have been located. None of that stops people from continuing to report strange happenings all over Cheeseman Park neighborhood to this very day, including cold spots, sudden sensations of dread, and ghostly orbs appearing in photographs. These may have nothing to do with Hunter's story, however, and much more to do with the fact that Cheeseman Park was originally a graveyard. As recently as 2010, workers digging trenches for the park's irrigation system unearthed four skeletons from the abandoned cemetery. And if that's not the beginning of a killer ghost story, then what is? Near the end of World War I, a bizarre disease known as sleepy sickness or lethargic encephalitis was contracted by millions of people across the world. There seemed to be no treatment for it, and the cause of the disease remains a mystery to this day. What was it, and why did nearly one million people who came down with the disease die from it while so many others did not? That's the problem. No one knows. Those who survived the disturbing illness probably wished they had died. It transformed people into living statues, forcing them to spend the rest of their lives trapped within their bodies and locked away in institutions, speechless and motionless. You're probably thinking that you've never heard of this, and there's a good reason why. The brain illness spread around the globe at the same time as the Spanish flu pandemic that killed over 50 million people, causing it to be overlooked by history in spite of the one million dead and the millions of lives that were affected by it. Although most cases were reported near the end of World War I, it's believed that the epidemic began in 1915 or 1916 when soldiers who displayed incredible lethargy and confusion were examined by doctors in Paris. At first, they assumed the cause of their unusual symptoms was mustard gas which had been used during the war, but this proved to be wrong. It turned out that the disease was already being studied by a neurologist from Vienna named Konstantin von Economo, who had been studying the effects of the illness in civilians. In a paper, he wrote, We are dealing with a kind of sleeping sickness, having an unusually prolonged course. The first symptoms are usually acute with headaches and malaise. Then a state of somnolence appears often associated with active delirium from which the patient can be awakened easily. He's able to give appropriate answers and to comprehend the situation. This delirious somnolence can lead to death 
rapidly or over the course of a few weeks. On the other hand, it can persist unchanged for weeks or even months with periods lasting bouts of days or even longer, a fluctuation of the depth of unconsciousness extending from simple sleepiness to deepest stupor or coma. Just a year after Economo's paper was published, the horrifying illness turned into an epidemic, taking its toll in human lives and leaving millions of people trapped in their own bodies. Lethargic encephalitis literally translates to brain inflammation that makes you tired, but it became commonly known as sleepy sickness. It's a funny name, but the result was anything but humorous. Most accounts state that over a third of those infected died, while around 20% survived but were more or less dependent on professional care for the rest of their lives. Sadly, fewer than one-third made full recoveries. It affected people of all ages, but like the Spanish flu, young people between 15 and 35 were hit the hardest. The initial stages of infection were a lot like the flu – a high fever, headache, feeling tired, runny nose, there was no way for the infected to know that he or she was battling a deadly disease which gave the virus just enough time to spread into the brain. The disease peaked just after the war but lingered for almost 10 years. Finally it began to fade, but it never completely disappeared. In fact, new cases were reported as recently as 1993. Modern doctors who studied the new cases came to believe that patients were affected by a rare form of Streptococcus bacteria. They noted that the massive immune reaction to the bacteria caused the immune system of the infected to attack the brain, resulting in brain damage. But that's just a guess. So far, there is no warning, no treatment, and no cure for sleepy sickness. It remains one of the strangest medical mysteries of all time. Road dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, you got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. The idea that there are similar or nearly identical realities that exist on a different level than ours has thrived in concept as far back as there is history. Olympus, Asgard, Magmel, Anwen, Ramapura – these places of legend go by many names in many cultures, but they are the same in the fact that they are like our world, but they are not our world. Science has long embraced the idea of multiple universes, including the infinite universe theory in which the universe is so big it can't help but repeat itself, and the parallel universe theory in which multiple universes are formed like a layer cake, each section not interacting with the others unless something happens and bits of the layers touch. The late great paranormal researcher John Keel best known for his 1975 book The Mothman Prophecies, wrote in his 1970 book Strange Creatures from Time and Space that he believed there were window areas 
in which the veil between universes was thin and sometimes, just sometimes, people go through. Parallel universes, dimensions that nearly resemble our own, were once pondered by Plato and proposed mathematically by Princeton University graduate student Hugh Everett III in 1954. These parallel worlds, common in myth, have been staples in science fiction since Edwin A. Abbott's 1884 novel Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. More modern science fiction, like the dimension-jumping television program Sliders and Philip K. Dick's novel The Man in High Castle, in which the Axis won World War II, gives us exciting glances at worlds like, yet unlike, our own. Exciting, unless you stumble upon one of these alternative dimensions yourself, as Carol Chase McElhaney did in early March 2006. Rain pounded McElhaney's car as she drove through San Bernardino, California to spend a few days at a sheepdog trial in Paris, California. As she topped a hill south of the city, she saw a road sign for nearby Riverside. Her family roots were put down in Riverside in the early 1800s and she wanted to visit familiar places, such as her old house and the cemetery where her grandparents were buried. "'I've been going to Riverside since I was a baby,' McElhaney said. "'I'm real familiar with the city. I know my way around. I knew where my grandmother lived. I've been to the cemetery. I knew where I was going.'" As McElhaney thought of visiting her grandparents' graves, a chill ran through her. Just as I decided to visit the cemetery, a huge blast of cigar scent entered my car, she said. It was pouring rain out, and I had my windows rolled up. My grandpa smoked cigars, and he died when I was five, and that's all I remember about him. Just as quickly as the smell floated through the car, it was gone. She drove past Riverside and on to Paris, where she checked into a hotel and attended the dog show. The next day, McElhaney attended the first sheepdog trial, then drove to Riverside. She did not like what she saw. I could not find anything familiar, McElhaney said. I used to live there after college. Her street wasn't the same. It was just wrong. The bungalows with small yards looked the same age as her old house and the numbers were right, but her house wasn't there. I could not find my old place, she said. I thought they couldn't have torn down the house and built another house in that 1920s style to fit into the architecture. None of the houses looked familiar. They all looked different. Then she drove to the street where her grandmother once lived, stopped the car, and looked around in amazement. It was totally different, she said. None of the houses were anything like I remembered. No tall trees. Her house wasn't there. The numbers were in the same range, but the houses were all new. Grandma's house and my aunt and uncle's house next door were gone, she said. All the homes on what should have been her grandmother's street were modern ranch-style houses lined by bushes, nothing like her grandmother's big two-door home with towering eucalyptus trees in the yard it was just gone. So was the cemetery. The cemetery where my grandparents were buried was just not there, McElhaney said. I drove around the block where it was supposed to be and it was just fenced off with weeds inside. No gate, driveway, or anything. Confused, McElhaney pulled away from the empty lot to see if she could find anything familiar. She did. She recognized Riverside City College and Central Middle School. Some of the other stuff was right. The college looked right, the middle school looked right, she said. But when she pulled onto University Avenue, things were markedly different. University Avenue was a main drag and there were scary-looking people, so I got out of there, she said. I looked for the Mission Inn and it wasn't there. University Avenue, once home to restaurants, insurance companies, banks, and motels, was now completely ghetto, McElhaney said. It was all graffitied up and deserted, to the point she was afraid to stop and ask for directions. It was on University Avenue she realized something otherworldly was happening to her. The thing that occurred to me is if I got out of my car and something weird would happen, McElhaney said, 
I thought if I talked to someone, I'd be forever caught in this weird version of the other Riverside or that they weren't going to be human. The more places I tried to recognize, nothing matched up. Nothing looked familiar. After a couple of agonizingly frustrating hours, McElhaney turned the car around and went back to Paris. Everything was normal, she said. I was afraid I'd go back and the hotel wouldn't be there or my key wouldn't fit. Everything was as it should be. A few years later, McElhaney's father died and was to be buried in the same cemetery as her grandparents, the cemetery she saw as an empty, fenced-off, weedy lot. It was back to what I remembered, she said. He was buried next to my grandparents. The rest of the city looked like it did when I lived there after college in the 70s. My cousin was there, and she said her house and my grandma's house are still there. University Avenue was normal-looking, and the Mission Inn was there. We had lunch there. I felt comfortable. I didn't go back to the other areas to check them, but I knew they would be okay. What happened to Carol Chase McElhaney? She's convinced she slid into another dimension, one that was less than friendly. I just got the feeling if I got out of the car and talked to someone, I was going to fall off the edge of the earth. I'd end up being missing, she said. It must have been a dimensional thing. It looked like it was 2006, but I had taken a different path. It looked like Riverside had just taken a different direction. Paul Calizo is convinced that in 1995, he traveled to a different dimension as well. Calizo lived in Rhode Island and had been to Newport many times. The city that was home to America's Cup yacht race for more than 50 years was only a 45-minute drive away, after all. He'd been there so often he considered himself a regular. One of his favorite places to eat was the Newport Creamery that served everything from buttermilk pancakes to burgers to clam rolls to the awful, awful and an ice cream cocktail of vanilla, chocolate, coffee, strawberry, mint, cotton candy, orange, bubblegum, chocolate mint, and mocha. You drink three, you get the fourth free. But on a day in 1995, he and his friend Kenny drove to this town of roughly 25,000 people for Kenny's dental appointment, and his world changed. After Kenny's appointment, they went out for lunch in this town that he knew so well and found something unexpected. I parked my car in a familiar spot and we walked down the famous America's Cup Avenue to Thames Street, Calizo said. They walked past the Shell service station that he was familiar with, but Calizo was surprised to see a wall slant downward and opened into a street that had escaped him during previous visits. I could see the ocean and all the sailboats in it, he said. I saw these little wooden stands selling souvenirs. We walked into a business district I'd never seen before, loaded with shoppers. Very busy, a two-way street. I can still see the bus stopping. There were several restaurants in this newly found area, but one caught Calizo's eye. Newport Creamery. He didn't know there was another location in town. I said to myself, I've never seen this one before, he said. I was also ashamed to say this to my friend because I didn't want to look like an idiot. Calizo paid for his lunch with cash, then sat and looked out the window to take in the area as he ate a cheeseburger combo and a Coke. I had a view of the ocean, watching people play frisbee and walk their dogs, he said. It was so amazing I could not wait to tell my wife. Everything else was normal. The restaurant looked like the other location. The food was the same. The people outside were dressed normally, and the cars along the street were as they should be. Excited for the new find, Calizo picked up his wife from work that night. I told her, wait until you see where I'm taking you Saturday night. Three days later, Calizo and his wife went to Newport, turned down America's Cup Avenue to Thames Street, and took a right at the Shell Station, just as he'd done with Kenny. But there was no wall that opened to a previously unknown street. I did not see the ocean, just a ball field and an apartment building, so I drove around for a half hour and gave up. He tried to take his wife to the new Newport Creamery twice more that summer. Then again in 1997, 1998, and 1999. In 1999, I walked every street side and rode off America's Cup Avenue and Thames Street, about three hours. I found nothing, he said. 
Calizo kept trying because he knew what he had experienced. That street, that shopping area, and that restaurant were real. He bought his first computer in the year 2000 and did a web search for Newport Creamery restaurants in Newport, Rhode Island. There were two listed, the one he'd been to previously and one on Bellevue Avenue. I said to myself, there's the answer, it's the one on Bellevue Avenue, Calizo said. That conclusion was satisfactory for me for the years following. It wasn't until he found Google Street View that the specter of the missing restaurant appeared again. He looked up the Newport Creamery on Bellevue Avenue. It wasn't the restaurant he'd been to in 1995. There was no ocean view, no shopping district, nothing familiar. He thought maybe Google Street View hadn't picked up the right angles. Calizo went to the Bellevue Avenue Newport Creamery in 2012 and discovered Google had been correct. This was not the right restaurant. He finally spoke with Kenny about it. He said to me he was also ashamed to say that area was unfamiliar to him as well, that there was something strange about that day. Calizo's curiosity exploded in 2016. He began to ask business people in Newport about the 1995 location, but no one knew what he was talking about. He talked with a Newport City clerk who said that there had never been more than two Newport Creamery restaurants in town and they'd never moved from another location. I told a co-worker of mine this story. He worked with engineering maps and he said to me that he was familiar with Newport. I described my situation the best I could, the wall, the water, he said. I think I know where you're talking about, Calizo said. He pulled it right up on the maps and I can see the satellite view. I said, oh my god, that's it. Calizo had found the area he'd once visited and eaten a cheeseburger combo and a Coke. But there was no business district, no wooden stands selling souvenirs, and no restaurants, especially not the one he remembers. There's room there for it, about a hundred yards of grass in front of some elevated houses. He went to Newport a week later, located the slanted path, and saw where he and Kenny had walked toward the ocean, but it was hidden on the opposite side of the street. He walked toward the ocean and stood on the ground where the restaurant had been, a place where no restaurant had ever been. It appears we entered a vortex and we slung shot around the other side of the avenue where the wall and ocean were on the left, Calizo said. The district we walked into was in another version of Newport, Rhode Island. I've investigated this for 21 years. The story is true. What happened to me? How did this happen? Maybe before 1995, that was my reality, and I went through a vortex going back and I'm in the other one now and never made it back. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. September 14, 2015. The Han House stood quietly in the shadows of two willow trees. Rotten boards on the windows that were halfway fallen apart, a front porch that had caved in completely, 
and three bold windows on the upstairs floor that stood out like eyes staring you down in the night. Built in 1875, the Hans House had quite a history. From old murders to present satanic rituals, everyone who walked by felt uneasy. I was a skeptic. Non-religious and non-believing in ghosts, that would all change soon. It was my senior year of high school. I was exactly 39 days away from graduating. From there, I would be on my way to college in North Carolina. I had two friends that I could trust with my life and maybe more, Alex and Lena. Alex had graduated two years ago, but we'd always remained close to each other. Lena was a senior who was graduating along with me. Lena and I had different college plans, but we were hopeful to take the same friendship road that Alex and I had taken. After all, we had been friends for most of our lives. I'm going to do my best to recall every detail of this story, even though I've always wanted to forget it. It's one of those life experiences that you can never forget no matter how hard you try. September 21, 2015 Alex, Lena, and I were all sitting on the floor of Alex's small apartment around a glass coffee table while Alex was rolling us a blunt. We had just finished a conversation about a story Alex's mom told him when he was little. It was a story about how, when she was a little girl, her and her older sister had a paranormal experience with a lady in blue. Keep in mind, I was a skeptic. I didn't think that any of it was real. I took it as a load of crap. As Alex flicked his white lighter to light our blunt, I asked him, what do you think about the Hans house? He looked up at me and Lena. The house on Old Hatcher Road? Yeah, the old house that's supposed to be the gateway to hell or something stupid like that. I took a long inhale and passed it Lena's way. I could feel the skeptic in me come out. There's no way a house could be a gateway to hell or even be haunted for that matter. It's just a tale that everyone around town knows about and tells to keep vandals out, I said, while I rolled my eyes and laughed. I drive past it a lot while going to work. I always feel nervous just driving by it. I've heard some really screwed up stories about that place, said Alex. Lena looks up from her phone and chimes in to the conversation. What stories have you heard? My mom always told me that about 50 years ago, there was a man living there with his wife. He came home one day and found her hanging from the second-story staircase, but that's not the story that scares me the most. Well, what's the story that scares you the most? I said. The actual Hans story is what I don't get. How could he have done that to his family? He apparently cut off their heads and buried them under the staircase after he'd burned their bodies. I looked up at Alex and started laughing. I guess the guy had a vision into the future about the Amityville story but added a twist to it. Alex reached into his back pocket and pulled out his wallet. Since you're so skeptical about the stories and hauntings, I have $75 on the fact there's no way we all couldn't walk out of that place the way we walked in. Alex placed $75 on the table in front of us. Lena looked at us both, a little nervous. I'm not stepping a foot in that damn place, she said. I picked up the money and started to fan it around. Friday night, we're all going. There's nothing we should be scared of. The rest of the day, we talked about all the stories we had heard about the Hans house and shared our partial excitement to venture into the inside for the first time. Around 7 that night, we went our separate ways to our homes to have dinner and sleep before our adventure began. September 22, 2015 I met up with Lena and Alex around 5.30 that afternoon at Alex's place. Upon arriving, Lena and Alex were outside waiting on me. I could see that Lena had a nervous look on her face. Lena was raised a Christian and to believe in spirits. She had never done anything like this. I put my car in park in the driveway and rolled down my window. Are we ready for this? Lena took the passenger seat in the front and Alex took the back seat. You seem scared, Lena, I said as I smiled at her. I just don't really think this is a good idea, especially how Alex wants to do this. I looked in my rearview mirror at Alex. What do you mean? I went out last night and bought a Ouija board. I wanted to do this right. I laughed. A freaking Ouija board? 
It's the dumbest thing you've ever bought besides that hoverboard you broke your leg on. We all began to laugh, and the tension began to ease a little. The sun had set, and the darkened night sky had a million stars to look at. The road to the Han house was desolate. No streetlights, no cars, no one and nothing, just a road with a night sky. I began to ease my way into the driveway of the Han house. The wood on the house was slowly rotting away, giving it an even more terrifying appearance. It stood still in the dark of the night. I put my car in park in the driveway and took a breath. Alex was the first one to step out of the car. Look at the front door, he said. Lena and I glanced up at the door. The words hell and Satan were painted in red spray paint across the door. Lena and I stepped out of the car and began to walk up to the house. The front door isn't an entry option, I said after looking at the caved-in front porch. Alex made the follow me hand gesture. We followed Alex around the house to the back. I could hear Lena breathing heavily as she was looking at all of the decay of the house. The back had a door that was halfway off the hinges. Alex pushed the door open and entered the house. I was next to enter. Lena stood outside for a moment, deciding whether or not she really wanted to step inside. Come on, Lena, don't let the ghosts of the Han family get you. Lena stepped in the house, finally. We were all standing in an empty room that we assumed might have been the kitchen at one time. The walls had halfway torn down flower wallpaper. The floor was nothing but wooden boards that seemed to be missing a few pieces. We walked a little further into another room that looked as if it could have been the parlor. I looked around me completely stunned at how beautiful the place must have once been. The grand staircase was to the right of me. The ceilings were high and crafted. Chandeliers hung from the high ceilings along with cobwebs. Alex set his backpack on the floor and pulled out three flashlights. He handed us each one. Alex turned his flashlight on and flashed the light around us. The far left wall had words written in red paint. We walked over closer to take a look at the words. This is what hell is. This is hell. Hell. Let me out, read Alex aloud. Alex shined his flashlight on another writing. I am no longer a human but an animal in a human shell. Alex turned around to us and said, All right, children, now that we've learned to read, let's learn to spell. I laughed a little as Alex pulled the Ouija board out of his backpack and sat it on the floor. Are we ready to begin? We all took a seat on the floor in a small circle. I think we all know the rules of how to play, right? asked Alex. Don't break the circle, and when we're done, we have to say goodbye. We joined hands and placed the planchette on the board. We looked at each other, trying to decide who was going to ask the first question. I decided to take the leap. We placed our hands on the planchette as I asked the first question. Is there anyone here with us right now? We waited for the thrill of the planchette moving, but there was nothing. Everything was still and silent. I attempted to ask again, is there anyone here with us right now? Again, it was still and quiet. Is there anyone here? Make yourself known, said Alex. Nothing but silence. I looked at Alex and smiled. I told you there's nothing special about this place. Alex asked another question. Is there anyone in here with us? This is stupid. I don't think we should do this, said Lena in a shaky voice. Looks like Lena won't be getting $75. All right, we'll go. Obviously, this isn't going to work, Alex said. Goodbye, sweet spirits. We stood up and Alex started packing things into his backpack. I flashed my light around a little more before we departed. Alex led the way back into what we assumed was the kitchen. He stopped dead in his tracks. What the? Isn't this the way we came in? I looked around the room and took note of the similar sights I'd seen when we came into the house. There's not a door here. I know we came through a door when we entered this house. I shined my light all around the room, searching for the door. There really wasn't a door anywhere. Alex, are you sure we came in this way? We walked right in and went straight to the next room. Alex began pacing around the room, feeling the walls. Lena's breathing had increased, and I started to panic a little. 
I walked back into the parlor where the front door was. I yelled out to Lena and Alex, let's just try to get down the front porch. Alex and Lena walked into the parlor. Alex grabbed for the front doorknob and quickly pulled his hand back and began to yell. Alex, what's wrong? I asked. Alex raised his hand. Skin was hanging from his hand as blood ran down his arm. The smell of burnt flesh filled the room. Lena screamed as I just stared at his hand, not knowing what to do. My hand! My, my hand! Alex yelled. I quickly took my jacket off and wrapped Alex's hand up as tight as I could to try to stop the bleeding. We need to get out of here now, said Lena. I ran back into the kitchen and started banging on the walls. I could hear Alex kicking the front door in an attempt to break it down. The door won't break! I let out a frustrated yell. I went back into the parlor. I noticed another room to the right of us. I picked up Alex's backpack. Maybe there's a window in here we can get out of. We walked into the next room to find an old, broken table, but no windows. I shined the light around the room. There was more writing on the walls along with drawings. I didn't even want to read them, I just wanted to find a way out. I searched for a window, door, or a slight break in the wood. There was nothing. Darkness has followed me and will remain with me. In this house you are not alone, Alex read to us. Alex, stop reading that crap, yelled Lena. I pulled out my phone and dialed my mom. I was hopeful that she would answer and get us out of here. The first ring, the second ring, hello, she picked up. Mom, Alex, Lena and I are at the old Hans house. It's like we are... I pulled the phone away from my ear in a rush. All I heard were blood-curdling screams and static on the other end. The kind of screams that make your skin crawl when you hear them in a horror movie. Darcy? asked Alex. My face had went cold. And my heart was beating faster than a drum. I tried to redial the number, but all I got were a few seconds of the dialing screen, then my phone would go black and restart to a distorted screen. I darted out of the room to the grand staircase where I began to run up it. Alex and Lena followed me. We got to the top of the stairs where we faced a long hallway with six doors on each side. Every door was open except for the last door on the left. The floor was covered in dry, rotted newspapers and torn clothing. Lena ran to the first two open doors and looked in each room. Come here, look at this! We walked over to the first room on the left and looked inside with Lena. Inside the room was an old surgery table with oil lamps sitting on a table. Alex walked into the room over to the table. He held up a rusted scalpel. What the hell happened in here? As Lena and I were about to enter the room, we heard a yell from behind us. I turned to look in a hurry. Lena looked back before me. Darcy, the room, the walls! I turned back to look into the room, but all I saw was a wall with no doors. I turned to the other side of the hallway to see more walls with no doors. There were ten doors, Lena, ten! I didn't know if I was more scared at the fact that there were no rooms or the fact that Alex was nowhere to be found. I ran to the end of the hallway and back to the stairs. Lena and I ran back downstairs. We started to yell for Alex with no reply. I sat down on the floor and burrowed my head deep into my lap. What the hell is happening? I yelled out. I felt tears stream down my cheeks. I looked up at Lena. She was staring at the stairs. I turned back to put my head back in my lap when I saw a figure crawling on the floor towards me. I closed my eyes, thinking my mind was playing tricks on me. The cold finger touched my skin as I closed my eyes tighter. The finger drug across my skin and gripped my arm. Against my better judgment, I slowly raised my head to look at the figure. Skin hung off of the face, exposing flesh and bone. Lena! I screamed out. The figure disappeared. I looked behind me at Lena, but she was gone as well. I got up and began running up the stairs when I heard a crash at the bottom of the stairs. I slowly turned around to see a contorted body with long, curly, blonde hair. I screamed out to Lena, hoping I wasn't seeing what I thought I was. I ran down the stairs to Lena and began to shake her violently. Lena, please, no! Tears began. I put down my face once more. What the hell do you want? I yelled out. 
What do you want? I grabbed Lena's hand and cried out for this all to just end. Sweat began to roll down off my forehead as I left the room getting hotter. It was the middle of September and the house had no electricity, so how could this be possible? I heard crackling from the kitchen. I turned to look and saw the orange and red flames of fire. The wood from the ceiling began to fall to the floor. I dropped Lena's hand and ran upstairs, not knowing where else to go. Upon arriving at the top of the stairs, I saw a figure enter a room. How was there a room when before there were ten and then none? I didn't give it much thought. I ran into the room after the figure, hoping it would be Alex. When I entered the room, I saw an antique oval standing mirror. In the mirror, there was a woman. She was smiling at me with a sweet smile. For the first time since being in the Hans house, I felt a sense of comfort. I walked closer to the mirror, slowly until I was right in front of it. The woman's smile went from inviting and comforting to a disfigured grin. She leaned her head back and made an ear-piercing scream like the one I'd heard on the phone with my mom. I was so frustrated and upset, the next thing I knew I had kicked the mirror and broken it. The mirror shattered and hit the floor. I picked up a piece of the mirror and stared at myself in the shard of glass. This isn't real. This isn't real. This isn't real, I said it to myself over and over again. I jumped at the sound of a door, slamming repeatedly. I stood up and ran down the stairs. Lena's body was still lying on the floor, contorted and mangled. I ran past her to find the kitchen door banging open and shut. The fire was out. The smell of burnt wood filled the air. You could see the soot and ash remaining from the fire. Tears of joy ran down my cheeks as I raced to the door. I pushed the door open and ran into the backyard. I grabbed at the lanyard around my neck, holding my keys, and jerked at it until it was off my neck. I ran around the side of the house to my car. Did you find the door? Alex called out to me. I stopped right where I stood. I couldn't say a single word. Darcy, are you okay? asked Lena. Alex and Lena walked over to me, confused. I took a step back from them. Don't come near me, I yelled at them. Darcy, calm down. What's wrong with you? I looked at Alex's hand. There was no burns, flesh, hanging skin. It was fine, just like it was before he touched the doorknob. I looked back at the house, then back at Alex and Lena. They were looking at each other. Okay, so now that you've had your little freak out, can we get this party started? Asked Alex. You know what? Let's just go. This place looks dangerous and anything could happen while we're inside. Lena let out a breath and said, Sounds good to me. This place creeps the hell out of me. We got back in the car and I threw the car in reverse. I felt at ease the minute I pulled out of the driveway. I hadn't said a single word until we were almost back to Alex's house. I looked in the rearview mirror at Alex and I smiled. In the corner of my eye, I saw the woman sitting next to Alex. The same woman I saw in the mirror. Alex, who's sitting beside you? I felt my voice crack as I asked him. I looked over to the passenger seat to Lena, but all I saw was an empty leather seat. Darkness has followed you and will remain with you. In this house, you are not alone. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I heard the whisper in my ear. I looked into the rearview mirror once more and saw the woman smiling at me. I looked over at the passenger seat to see the figure that was crawling towards me. I saw the blood dripping down the half-ripped open jaw on the figure's face, disgusting and disfigured. I blinked my eyes quickly. I saw the halfway torn down flower wallpaper and the wooden floors that were missing pieces of wood. Come on, Lena, before the ghost of the haunt. I cut Alex off. Alex, let's leave now and never bring this back up again. We don't belong here. We aren't welcome. I believe every story I've heard. Alex, Lena, and I closed the door back and walked back to the car. The Han house had played so many tricks on me, it was hard to believe what was real and what was not. I didn't dare look in my rearview mirror. I don't think I could have relived the horror I had just faced. Alex and Lena talked on the ride back to his house, but I remained silent. I was still trying to process every emotion I just experienced. What I saw, what I felt, what I heard, 
it was enough to make me a believer. 36 days later, Lena and I graduated high school. I went to North Carolina, Lena went to Pennsylvania, Alex stayed in Georgia, and months later went to investigate the Han house by himself. I will never forget the words he told me afterwards. Darkness has followed me and will remain with me. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.